for like I don't know an hour or something it's like wow <laughs> is is there anybody who would be interested listening but of course a lot of people a lot of people are and a lot of people will so so <laughs> now you can feel comfortable talking about your your for your like work. I don't know an hour or something it's like wow <laughs> is is there anybody who would be interested listening but of course and i can hear people. myself oh yeah yeah, yeah 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 it's because give me a sec a lot of people are and other people will yeah that's all we're we're streaming on youtube but we have like three four seconds of delay not like a minute of delay that's why you you listen to yourself it's not yeah. your conscious i promise <laughs> i'm not getting crazy <laughs> it's not right? your mind yeah yeah it's not it's not your mind maybe it is but we're not listening to it so mm -hmm. great. Now it's uh, 12 o'clock here in Mexico. It's, I believe it's, you're in Paris right now? Yes, I am. <laughs> it's 7 p.m., right? Yes, exactly. Great. Okay. Well, first of all, welcome to everyone. Let me start recording. There's, uh, there's going to appear a message. Just accept it, please. Sure. One, two, three. Yeah. Continue. Great. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm super, super excited about this monthly Feminist Dialogue. This is our second uh, international dialogue and it's the first one we, we do it in English. I hope uh, in a few months or maybe in a couple of years we can help them actually in French. That would be fun. So it would be <laughs> less complicated for, for a lot of people. Uh, I'm super excited to introduce today our special guest. But after, but before that, sorry, I'm going to introduce myself. So you actually put a face uh, and, and the name behind uh, all the Filminist thing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Filminist so you know about our festival, our events and our projects. And I'm going to introduce my co-founder, that is Deyanira. She's going to talk a little bit about the dialogues and then we're going to start. So first of all, my name is Nina. I am in Mexico. I am one of the co-founders of Filminist. Today, I have the pleasure to, to uh, be the moderator or the interviewer of our guest. And if you don't know what Filminist is, please follow us. Filminist is a really genuine and lovely project. Uh, it's a festival. It's a different kind of festival. It's not a competition festival. We do it once per year, but every month or every two years, we do this kind of dynamics. I'm not going to talk about it. That Yanira is gonna is gonna talk about them, but our festival, our main objective is to visualize, recognize, and connect women within the film industry from everywhere in the world. It doesn't matter if you are an operatrice, a, a cinematographer, or if you work in sound mixing, or if you are uh, in charge of makeup, or if you are the director or the main actress. We want to give you the voices that that you need. To, 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 you know, to not only show your work, but to build certain kind of dialogues and conversations, because as we know in the film industry, there's, there's a difference between men activity and female activity or male activity and female activity. And with Filminis, we're just trying to put every woman, every talent together, just to raise their voices and to feel safe talking about the real themes that we wanna talk about the real topics that we, that we actually want to talk about. And that is Filminist. So you can follow us in every social media, in TikTok, we are in, in Twitter, we are in Facebook, we are in Instagram, and of course, at YouTube. So now I'm going to introduce my co-founder, that is Teyanira, so she can explain this monthly dialogues were, are all about. Go ahead, my dear. Thank my dear. you. Thank you, Nina. Um, we are very, very excited, as Nina mentioned it before, to have you here. And actually, this is our second international uh, monthly talk. And what is the what is this uh, monthly monthly talks? Uh, this is this is a like a side project um, uh, from the festival Filminist. In our Filminist monthly talks, we promote virtual dialogues uh, between women in the industry. And together we talk and we share our experiences and we organize ourselves to, to keep creating. So that's like a short and blur um, description about that, that we are doing here. And we are 
very, very excited to have you here. So I'm back to Nina. <laughs> Thank you, Deyanira. Well, so now we're going we're gonna to start with our monthly conversation. I know you were here connected not to hear about us, but to hear about our guest. Her name is, let me pronounce it correctly, Evgenia Alexandrova, right? Amazing. 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 I, I actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, maybe I'm, uh, it, it sounds like I actually know your, your name, like the beginning, you know? When you send it to me, I was practicing like, in Spanish, it would be like Eugenia. So I Eugenia, like, yes, of course. Oh my God, how can I say this? So she is Evgenia Alexandrova. And you're doing, you're doing better than most of the French because they usually say like Evgenia, Eugenia, Eugenie, like all different types of, of my... <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yeah. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to ask you, at uh, uh, Instagram, you're like... Uh, I Genia. don't know. Genia. Do you pronounce it yes. Genia? Oh. Yes. Because oh, so I'm, a, I'm of the Russian origin and we have like long and short names for each name, basically. Okay. So Evgenia is my full name, but like okay. it's kind of an official one. And Jenny is like a short one. And all of my friends, my parents, and everybody called me Jenny. So, yeah. So basically, at the beginning of this Instagram account was my friend's unofficial uh, photo album account. Yeah. But, like more and more people from the from the profession started to, to getting to me. And so everybody's asking me the same question. But, but like, <laughs> you can call me both. Evgenia or Jenny is good. Okay. So you, 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 you don't care. It's Evgenia or, or Jenny? Yeah, as long as it's not Evgenia, it's good. Uh, oh, okay, okay, Evgenia. Evgenia or Genia. Okay, it's it's amazing. And Alexandrova, it's it's fine or? Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, okay, great. You have a really good pronunciation. Oh, thank you very much. I've been practicing. I was I wasn't joking. And let me just read about your career because I've practiced more to to <laughs> to pronounce those. So uh, I'm gonna read a bit a little bit about her short bio. After her studies in cinematography at the French school La Femme. Evgenia works both as director of photography and director. For her end of the study, she did a film called Svalbard. Yeah? Okay, okay. You, you tell me. You can correct me. Okay? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> she shot on a remote Arctic island where she later returned to direct Einstein Telescope, the winner of the best sci-fi short at Brooklyn Film Festival 2021. She also made Wanderers, a documentary describing the experience of a space simulation in which Evgenia participated. As a cinematographer, she works on fictions, documentaries, and commercials. Her works include Noemi Merlon, Mi Yubita Mon Amour, premier, uh, premiered at Cannes, at Cannes 2021, and Rémi Brachet, La Fin des Rois. Oui? Amazing, yes. You're doing well. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Nominated for the uh, Cesar Awards for Best Short Documentary in 2022. So now we can start. Welcome, uh, Genia, 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 Genia. Genia, yes. Thank you, Genia, for your time. Welcome. We're super excited. So now, is there something you want to say first before we begin? Well, of course, first of all, I, I want to thank you for inviting me for this meeting because it's like, it's I think it's the first time I get like a full talk where I can talk about my job, uh, like one hour or something. I don't know how, how much, how long people were, were going to stay. But uh, so thank you very much, Nina, for your interest in my work. And uh, I mean, like you watched all of those films that you mentioned, I guess, most of them. So thank you very much for taking the time. And also I, I want to, to thank Mage, who is here, I think, uh, for putting us in contact and for being such a, um, devoted follower on, on Instagram and following uh, Noemi and also like being super um, inspiring figure <laughs> from our recent acquaintances. So I'm very happy to be here and I'd like to talk about anything you want. Probably most, mostly anything. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Thank you very much. And yes, thank you, Mage, for, for your support and for being one of the best promoters on French uh, female talents that there she can is. Be. <laughs> she actually is. Yeah, she is. So thank you very much for putting us in contact and and for your time. So now let's gonna start. I know I've read a little bit about your bio, but we always start with this same question. Um, if I was in an elevator and I was a director you would like to meet or a producer or a, ta a talent that you need for a production yourself and you had just one minute to do an elevator pitch about 
who Evgenia is, how would you present yourself? Maybe it could be longer than one minute. This is a slow uh, elevator. I really need to, uh, need to know for which kind of job I'm applying for. For the Depends, in, or... in, in which one you pick? Cinematographer. Okay, cinematographer. Then I, I'm kind of used to sell myself as a cinematographer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's amazing. Then you, you don't uh, need to practice or anything. So just go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, usually you would call my agent and she would, would do all the commercials <laughs> all the promotions but uh, basically usually it depends on what kind of director you are and what kind of project you are aiming to, to make but usually I, I will i will i would say that as a cinematographer my main goal and my my biggest passion in my job is how to um how to tell the story so this is my first aim i'm not like doing uh i'm not i'm not doing cinematography just to make like you know beautiful images and just cool cameras and just, I don't know, uh, doing a lot of brief stuff. What I'm interested in is, is in a collaboration with the director and like really uh, trying to find the best way to, to tell the story. So, I mean, th that's why probably I can't say that I have a, a like one standard style in the cinematography. Like I, I like being handheld and using a lot of brief. I like it colored, I like black and white. It really, really depends on, uh, on the project. So I guess my main skill is adaptation. So I'm here just to, to reply to your needs and bring my sensitivity to your project. I think that's the best elevator pitch anyone can give, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, was, that was really good. And you said something really interesting that I wanna uh, talk about it later. Um, I've seen three of your of your projects. I haven't had the chance to to watch your work at Miyubita, for example, but I've not seen yet. Uh, not yet, not yet. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Yeah, um, but I've seen the three main things that you've done. If I'm not uh, yes, the one yeah. that I directed. Yeah, the, the one that you directed is Svalbard. Yeah, Svalbard. Svalbard yes, Svalbard. Yeah, Instant Telescope and Wonders. Yes. And I wanted to ask you, I know a lot of people here haven't, haven't uh, watched them, but if, if you give us the chance, maybe we can talk about it later. We can make a, a something so we can have your projects in our main page or maybe with a special code for Vimeo so people can watch it through a week or something. It would be really, really interesting because you really have a talent. I am so amazed by your work. I, I, I'm not. I'm not saying this just I'm because blushing. you are connected. No, 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 no. I, I, I'm in love with cinematography and, and and with films and everything. But the job that you do is really amazing, and you have a special touch that I found that it that is um, through the color, through the colors, and through certain kind of uh, um, framing, framings that you do. I think you like a lot of spaces and stuff yeah. like open spaces or or cold colors sometimes. But we're, we're gonna we're gonna talk about it later. But the first thing that I wanted to ask you is, how did you came up with the idea of the three of your main projects? If you can, if you can tell the story of each one of them, okay, uh, because yeah, it's sure. really they're really interesting. The plot, the plot of, of the three of them, they're quite interesting. And I have a couple of theories, but I'm gonna ask them. Uh, yeah, in a few minutes. So I hope people, uh, you are comfortable because it's gonna be a long story. <laughs> But definitely That's why you're here, yeah, yeah. You, you yeah. can talk every everything you want. Okay, good. So all of the three projects you mentioned, they are connected. There is a special link between them, even though it wasn't planned like that. But so I can tell you the story. So I studied at La Femis, this cinema school in Paris, and as the end of the studies project, we had to make a film, a film that would, would be connected with our written work, like uh, 70 pages on whatever topic we feel is connected to cinematography. And I felt like really strongly, I wanted to film the, the snow for my end of the studies movies. And I have this passion for Scandinavian countries, but I really want to, to find some like really special place and go there. And uh, one day I was Instagramming. So I was scratching, scrolling my feed and then I saw like somebody uh, posted a picture from Svalbard. So Svalbard for you to know, it's a thousand kilometers from North Pole. And it's, yeah, it's an island in the middle of Arctic. And there is, uh, th there is the located the world's northernmost town. 
So the people who live there, they're like basically the closest to the uh, Northern Hemisphere. So immediately I fell in love with the pictures of the place. So I went to for, uh, I went there. It's actually, it, it used to be very easy to go there and now much more complicated since, uh, since the COVID times. Uh, but still it's kind of easier than it sounds like, like going to the northernmost town. So I went there for scouting and then I came back in March, 2016 to film in there. And uh, I didn't really have the clue of what I was about to film. I knew I wanted to make a documentary about the place. And the main challenge for me, uh, generally as a cinematographer or director, and especially for those three films, is talking about what I feel. So my main job is to translate my feelings into filming. And it's like not obvious at all. Like, you know, it's, it's like, it's something you feel you sense inside yourself. And then you, you just try to put in images and sounds and make people feel emotions. And it was kind of a hard job to do. So we filmed in Svalbard and I really like fell in love with this place. Something really incredible happened to me there. I like, you know, it's like only nature and nature is wild. You have like 2000 people living there and 4,000 polar bears hunting around. So yeah, very, very quickly, like you, you go out of town and the nature reminds you of who's in charge there. So um, uh, yes, I got really, really like, I had this very strong feeling of connection to something bigger than me over there. Like, I don't know, like, you know, this cold nights with snow and you and you see the stars and you see the northern lights and you're like, I feel like I have no more intermediary between me and the universe, between me and the source or something. Somebody calls it God or whatever, but like, I feel like I was on the direct line with something like really great, you know? And it inspired me so much. So I, so we filmed there for three weeks. Uh, and also at the same moment uh, when we were there, the first um, announcement appeared about the discovery of gravitational waves, which meant basically that black holes existed for real. For the first time, we could prove that they existed and that Einstein, back in 100 years ago, he was actually right and that he was a visionary. And I started reading about that, black holes, and like it completely blew my mind, especially the idea of the time being nonlinear and that you can like travel through time space and everything is like, nothing is like it used to be, you know, in, in our ideas. So um, I really became passionate about space at that moment. I was reading everything I could find about it. So you can see already in Svalbard, I, I make some parallels between, between the, this town and the space, because actually the, 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 landscape, the landscape is very, very out of space, you know, because they don't have any uh, vegetation there. There are only mountains. So it looks like it could be the moon or Venus or any other planet. So I, and that's how I felt. Um, and so I had those two characters I was following in Svalbard, this girl who lives in there, and she's always, uh, she talks about how she dreams of space and how she would love to go out with Yuri Gagarin, the first astronaut traveling in space. And she's all like up in there. And the second character is Tommy, who is a miner and who works in, in, in the coal mine. Coal, coal mining was the basic industry that like, that's why Svalbard got, got to be explored because there are no people being born there. It was, it was, it was inhabited in the beginning of, of 20th century. And so the, sec the second character, Tommy, he lives most of his life, he spends it underground. So I, I really wanted to do this like a three level uh, story about underground, in a, like land, yes, and, and up in the sky. So that was the idea. So that's how I got contaminated with the space uh, fever for the first time. Uh, and I started reading about it. And then my film, this documentary, was screened at uh, Lesson Matek Francais. And, um, and there I met a producer, Katya, from Aurora Film, who uh, produced, uh, who came to me and who said, um, I really like your film. Don't you want to do something else? Do you want to have a fiction, uh, write a fiction? Sorry, my mom is texting me. I, I think she's probably watching as well. Don't worry, don't worry. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> Answer to your mom. <laughs> Their priorities. Yeah, of I'm course. just going to send her the link. <laughs> um, sorry for this. No, don't worry. It doesn't matter. 
It's okay. <coughs> I'm sorry, I coughed. <laughs> So yeah, so that's the, the first story about Svalbard. Yeah. Um, that's how I met my producer who asked me whether I wanted to do a fiction or whether I have any plans in directing because basically it was my cinematography end of the studies movie. And I, I actually wanted to make a fiction happening in Svalbard because I, I, I was really passionate about the place, but I, I didn't know what exactly to talk about. Again, the, this thing about like translating the feeling into a film and it took me ages to write a story, like seriously ages. Um, I really like the film Interstellar, um, you know, which talks about uh, uh, time and space continuum. And I really like the message about life, love, sorry, um, traveling through time and space. Like it's it's the only like um, wave that can, you know, like travel through different times and spaces. And I wanted to do something like, like this, like th that would give a little sense of vertigo and that we'll talk about something bigger. And I had this idea to talk about a scientist. So at the time I was reading a lot about scientists being visionary, uh, Einstein, as I mentioned, but also uh, I read about uh, Pauli, who was a, um, um, sorry, not quantum physics uh, scientist, work with Carl Jung talking about psychoanalysis at the same time as physics you know like making parallels between something that we are used to think as of very factual and very precise but actually I think the most inspiring scientists are those visionaries and those like very intuitive types so this was my inspira inspiration then I started writing but like I couldn't find any good structure um, and um, uh, somebody started helping me with the script and at some point they told me like maybe because I started writing it with a the character being a male and and then at some point this guy he told me why wouldn't why wouldn't you switch your character to, to a female and then I tried and it completely like deblocked me from from all of my reserve previous reserves and so my idea behind the scenes is that so I told you that Svalbard was um, inhabited for coal mining industry, the basis. And now the industry is in, in the crisis because of, well, it's not very ecological to, to extract coal. So I think this year they closed the last mine. So I got to film it before it got closed. And so I tried to, uh, while reading about the gravitational waves and black holes, I found out that there is a new prototype, a new observatory that is about to, to, to be installed, which is called Einstein Telescope Observatory. And so basic, basically they need several conditions uh, for it to be installed. Uh, it needs to be installed in a cold place, uh, blocked from the interfering waves, uh, and it needs, to be, um, it needs to have tunnels. And I just like imagined it to be installed in the ancient coal mines in Svalbard. And then like the story was born. And then I took this female character that I placed in it and I really wanted for it to be a very personal story of hers, but also I wanted her to be a, a strong intuitional scientist who like, like she trusts her guts instead of being very rational. And at some point she, it leads her to the truth or at least to her truth. So that's the story behind Einstein Telescope. Um, and while I was writing Einstein Telescope, um, it took me, I told you, it took me ages to write it. So my producer was desperate at some point. Um, so as I was uh, very inspired by space and very passionate about it, I Googled a lot of stuff. I read a lot of books. Uh, I, I read Chris Hatfield's guideline, how to be an astronaut, like many different stuff. And I found this place, well, there are a lot, several of them in, on Earth, but there is one, this place in Utah, state of Utah in the United States where there is this prototype of a Martian station, which is installed by this organization called Mars One, or whose main goal is basically to promote uh, the humans landing on Mars. So they try to do everything they can to, to help people arrive to Mars. So there is this station where you can try to simulate living in space. And basically anyone can apply, but um, they, they like pick people that, that they want to see in their place. So um, you just have to write a mission statement. And I wrote that I want to make a documentary there. So we were, I'm not sure how many were, I think we were like hundred applying 
for, for the position and we ended up to be six. We actually were supposed to be eight with two more ladies coming, but they dropped out just before the project. So I ended up being the only lady with uh, five men. And so we went there to Mars Desert Research Station uh, where we closed ourselves for two weeks. So basically we were living in this 70 square meter dome where we were had really small rooms where we were sleeping. Uh, and then we ate dehydrated food and we had like very cold showers once every three days and the uh, conditions were really rustic, but I mean, it's okay. And every time we were going out of the hub, we needed to put on the spacesuit or something that simulated spacesuit. So you are wearing this helmet and the whole suit weighed for 13 kilos. And then we were actually doing those like, you know, um, healed ascensions so we were walking a lot actually uh, i think i lo lost like four kilos when i was there or something and um, so i did the, the cinematography and the sound of this film because i couldn't bring anybody with me as i was part of the simulation and so yeah so this is how wanderers were born <laughs> it is it is amazing actually you you were prepared for a lockdown. You you lived this lockdown exactly. before the, the COVID lockdown or it was at the same time? It was just before. So I, I actually was fashionable before it became fashion, you know? <laughs> oh my God. And it is it is amazing. So so in in that project, they try to make people feel they're actually landing in Mars, right? That's like and it, yeah, so we had no no connection with outer world except wow. on mission control. Um, I was doing uh, I was responsible for journalist reports and each day, so I was writing reports. We had different different tasks. We had the green hub where we had to take care of the plants. We had the um, uh, radio tests. So when we were doing our EVA, which which stands for extravehicular activity, so when we were basically uh, driving rovers in our spacesuits. So we tried our communications there. We did the mapping. Uh, we actually, well, you, you see it in the movie and it's kind of a spoiler, but we tried to connect with the International Space Station, which could have been actually achieved if, if we were not out of their uh, working hours. So they were basically resting by the time we tried to connect them, but they were literally flying over us and we had all the equipment to connect to them. And we were so excited to do this. So yeah, and then we also, uh, did some experiments on gypsum, so we were occupied basically. And how how did you tell the? I, I mean, because there were a hundred people in a waiting list. Yeah. Did you explain that you wanted to do a documentary about this, or? Yeah. So basically, okay. I explained why I would be a good candidate. You know, like I did uh, with you with PR and marketing one minute. So I did kind of the same thing, telling that I come from the international background. I'm used to, I'm um, communicative. I hope so. Um, and like uh, I can be in the international team and also um, explaining that I love space and that I want to do a documentary and it will help to promote uh, Mars missions and everything. So I kind of, yeah, wow. presented that was, myself. That was quite, yeah, that was quite of an experience. I mean, I mean, you you were in a lockdown. You ate like astronauts actually eat because they eat this dehydrated weird food. Was it exactly. or? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like those dry potatoes that you put some water in them and then become real potatoes and like um, fake cheese. And yeah, <laughs> it was amazing. It, it sounds pretty amazing. I hope people can watch it because it's really, really beautiful, uh, that, yeah. that documentary. And I, I have a question that you kind of answer right now. I noticed that you actually have this kind of fixation with with the space and and, and universe, um, I mean it's obvious in two of them, but but in the three of them you have this touch that actually make you feel like this small thing inside a big universe, but that we are connected. Because that thing that you're saying, I felt it in your in uh, Einstein's uh, telescope. Telescope. I I felt like if I was the girl, even though. I am not a scientist, even though I'm not there, I'm not trying to find what she's trying to find. But I, you, you made me think a lot of things. You made me think about how after you achieve something big in your life, 
then the other thing, if it's not as big as the past uh, goal that you did, how can you be grateful, you know, uh, uh, just as, as big as the past uh, goal that you, that you achieved? And I came with that idea and with that um, um, thought after watching the three of them, one after the other, because I believe in wonders, there's a dialogue when someone is talking about when an astronaut goes out, then you, you come here to earth and know yeah. what, I mean, you've been to a space, so what else? And maybe we, we are not astronauts, but, but it's kind of fun because I know every one of us have failed like that with some achievements in our lives. Like, I mean, I, I went to a space, so after that, I don't know if I feel the kind of empty. Is that the feeling that your main character at Einstein Telescope kind of has? Um, I hope not. <laughs> okay. Um, in Einstein Telescope, she's actually, she kind of got to know a real feeling for someone, but who disappeared. Well, in my, in my imagination, they never meet for real. And they actually only talked by the, the radio with this you know that they, they became the closest persons to each other in the world because like they were talking to each other every day and with this delay so when he disappeared she didn't even know he disappeared for some time so i hope she's not feeling this way and my idea was that in the in the ending of the film she like comes into peace with the, with herself and with the situation and with the story i guess but um that's funny that you mentioned this yeah i was about to answer yeah that in wonders they talk about this astronaut Michael Collins, who who was um, orbiting around the moon, I think, while the two others landed. And he got a really huge depression. And also this character of uh, Mark, who was our commander while we were in the, in the space simulation, he went for one year in, to, Northern, or to South Pole, sorry. And he was really depressed when he came back. Like, I mean, when you spend so much time living at the edge of your uh, capacities and in such a special place like how do you come back to like boring everyday life and I guess well uh, psychoanalysis is my other passion so <laughs> um yeah um so I guess I it, like for me it, it took me ages to get to enjoy my life like in everyday things in small things you know and I understand like when you do something major and you come back to something what you might call primitive or just like basic. Yeah, it, it can be very sad, but I guess we can do more major things after. I mean, space is not the only thing. You can go underwater, you can go, uh, I don't know, you can go to some really crazy places if, if you look for them, so. You can go inside yourself, but I think that's the biggest universe of all, That's right? the longest journey. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's the youngest, uh, the longest journey. That That's, that's really, really true. Um, so space and universe have some special meaning for you, uh, like in a, an emotional way or just a fixation that you like to tell stories about those topics? Absolutely emotional. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm more of an emotional person than a brainer or, or something else or s s sensorial. I'm really, really, you too. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> That's why we connected. <laughs> Uh, so I'm very much emotional and my first emotions about space, they were born the, the day I went to Svalbard, the story that I told you about. So that, that was the beginning of it. And it's absolute, to me, it's absolutely, my, my, space is mind blowing. And I just like, it makes me feel very reassured knowing that there is something bigger in this universe and that I'm connected to it. So um, yeah, it's absolutely emotional. No, nothing rational about me. Yeah, that, that's uh, yeah. I, I wanted to to know that because because I know it's quite obvious because of the plot of the stories. But you have that touch. I don't know if in every uh, project you do, you portray this this um, visual things that connect you to space because it's not only like filming the stars, right? It's just how you see the landscapes and everything. I noticed that in in the three of your of your uh, works. Because it's, I think you do have a style. I don't know how to define it, but you have this kind of uh, visuals that are, that are, that just make you feel that we are a small part of this universe. It doesn't matter if the story is not about it. You have that touch in framing certain landscapes or things that you you feel like that. 
I, I don't know. I, I feel like that. I, I don't know if, if, if uh, for example, Mage that I know that she's watched your projects too, if she felt like that too. But if you were trying to portray that and to make uh, people feel uh, that, let me tell you that you actually did. So, so that is quite I'm a, so happy you're saying this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I feel like that. I'm, 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 I'm being super, super uh, 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 truthful with you because it is, it, you don't need a dialogue to make you feel like a small thing in the world, but at the same time, something bigger. You just need the correct frame or the correct scene or the correct uh, music. And you did the three of them quite good in the three mm -hmm. of your, of your uh, projects. I hope, I hope you're doing some more Evgenia uh, own documentaries or long, uh, long short, uh, sorry, long film, sorry, films or, uh, or short films. But I don't know if you're right now working on something for your own or you're still working with other uh, independent projects. Um. I would love to continue directing, but it <laughs> probably takes me a lot of time writing. I'm like, I'm very, I'm a very spontaneous person. So sometimes I'm like, I have an idea and I have to, if I haven't written it down straight away, it's like getting back to it two weeks later is going to be complicated. Um, I had this project. Uh, I had also this short film that I was about to develop with, uh, with the same producer I told you about. Uh, and it was the story about the girl being like a like a very young prodigy who was about to go to space, and she was she was proposed to go to to Mars one way, go to Mars. And it's a story about her dad, who was um, really supportive for her career, and who realizes that now he's gonna let her go for the for the and never see her again. So it's also about those feelings and the greatness of space. You know, it's always like human story on the background of the space uh, but then we um, uh, we stopped with this project because something very com very similar came out on the screens actually um, I'm sorry I have a blackout uh, for the for the film name it was a French film um, I'm sorry I, I just Maybe I'm nervous, so I can't remember. Was it? What I don't know. It was uh, with Evergreen uh, being an astronaut and leaving for oh, space. No. I, I, I got a lot of time. Yeah. yeah, so it was kind of. Uh, it was directed by Alice Vinocour, a French director. Um, so we kind of stopped it, and then I had another idea about a psychoanalysis as a main character uh, uh, meeting a new client, uh, a kid, and realizing that he's a kind of a reincarnation of somebody sh she used to know. So also this space time travels, but then I lost interest for it. <laughs> but now I have a, a new idea of, of a film, um, of a feature film. Uh, it's still like kind of uh, developing in my mind, but um, I haven't started writing yet. So. I'm not spoiling it before. No, 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 don't spoil it. Just just yeah. keep it in your mind. And when you have it, you tell us. And of course, we will talk about it or screen it or whatever you whatever you need. It's amazing. It's amazing how you how you uh, keep up with your ideas. Um, I don't know. How is this called in, in, in English? If someone can help me here that speaks Spanish, eh, el síndrome del impostor. Ah, imposter syndrome. Yes. You, have you heard? <laughs> Um, of course, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> everybody. Yeah. And so it's a, yeah, it's a really weird thing. How, how do you overcome the imposter syndrome? Uh, and I think it, it happens to you in different ways because you are also a screenwriter. I, I mean, you don't say yourself or do you, you don't present yourself as a screenwriter, but of course you've, you've written screenplays and, and, and yeah. directed them. So you're a writer too. You create stories. How do you overcome imposter syndrome um, in terms of cinematography, in terms of uh, directing when, when, you, when you are a director and in the written part? Maybe it's the same way, but maybe there are different imposter Evgenias appearing in your mind. <laughs> That's a, that's a very hard question because I realized that I used to suffer a lot from imposter syndrome. And at some point I started just suffering less. And I, I don't have like, you know, special um, tips how to do it. 
I guess I'm actually following a psychoanalysis. I'm being followed with my analyst and super interesting. And it was like, it was brilliant for me. It uh, like made me, you know, remember that we're all, all mortals. We have a very limited time that we can spend here. And seriously, spending this time uh, being worried about what people think of you or being worried about the fact that you are not good enough. It's just like, it takes too much energy, you know, being constantly thinking of you're not good enough and just, yeah. And I, I mean, also, there is a very good advice I read once in a blog or something like, if you think of something, just do it, you know? The, the, short, the shorter the space between your idea and its realization, the less time you have for, for getting like these bad ideas into your head. Just, just do your job and you'll see how it goes. And like, uh, and I think the main thing is like forcing yourself to switch your focus from yourself to what you're doing, you know? Like being really in, in the action, in, in writing, directing, like trying your best and not thinking of yourself. Like, you know, there is this theory of the flow. So when you get into the flow, you really forget yourself. You're just completely in, in the process. So I guess it's about this. Once you get in the flow and there's something you're really passionate about, like you think about like if you worth it like a little bit later, okay? But at this time you're just making, you're just doing your job. And I guess it's this, it's the focus on the action. That's quite interesting. And uh, thank you for the tip, <laughs> for the yeah. advice that you read on the on the blog. That is that is quite true. Just step and another step and the exactly. next step and just act. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Marianne, that's her, Marianne, that's uh, my best friend. She says that the movie you're talking about it's called Proxima, but I don't know if it's. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the name in in French too. That's the name in French. Yes. Oh, I'm not okay. Sure it's, the name in... it, 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 it's a word in Spanish. That that's why I, it was like, oh, really, Proxima? Okay, great. Um, what were some of the challenges that you've had filming? Uh, Svalbard, Einstein Telescope, and uh, Wonders, because I believe each one of them has, or may may had, sorry, some some challenges, technical challenges, or or I don't know, uh, yeah, technical basically. What were some well, of the challenges that you experienced? Well, technical challenges, it's, it's easy. So, both of the films that we shot in Svalbard, um, it was like super cold for uh, when we, actually. Fun fact, Svalbard is shot half in Svalbard. Oh, sorry, Einstein Telescope is shot half in Svalbard. All the exteriors are shot in Svalbard and all the interiors, they were shot in Corsica, like a very, very Southern island in France. So we actually had to find this house that looks that looked like a Norwegian house and those interiors that would be like, um, that would, would look like they, they, they could be in Svalbard. So mixing the two universes was kind of a uh, kind of a challenge because and also this shooting of Einstein telescope is it was cut in two because of the COVID. So I actually went we went to shoot in Svalbard in March 2020, and then for we were the the shooting was stopped for six months, and six months later we had to we had to go back to shooting the interiors. And actually, it was funny because my my actress she cut her hair short. She didn't realize like we were filming, so we had to find her like this those hair extensions for the, in the last day before shooting. So it, it was quite a challenge to go back to the mood of the film six months later. You know, um, yeah, and it was my really first time um, guiding the actors. You know, so it, it was the biggest challenge for me. I completely. Like I, I did my short list and I knew how I wanted to be filmed the fiction and I completely delegated it to my cinematographer who was the guy from my from, from my year at La Femis, Maxime Simonier. And so I was completely uh, like um, delegated and I was really concentrated on acting and um, that went really well. I got, we got a really good connection with Julia who, who plays the role of Sky. And that, that was my main challenge I wasn't I wasn't sure whether I could direct a movie that a fiction that would work um, and then as for documentaries um, well Svalbard was my first documentary and I, I my main challenge was how to 
as I mentioned, how to translate the feeling into, into images. I was like, when actually, when I went scouting in Svalbard in 2015, I met a woman I wanted to film. But as it happens in Svalbard, people get very spontaneous. And when I came back with the team, with the crew, she left the island. So I had to find somebody at the very last moment. And actually, I filmed Ida, who became a really good friend of mine today, because I was staying at her house. And we got those very interesting talks. And I ended up like really uh, liking her. And I wanted to film her. She's such a beauty as well. So she was like, oh my god, I need to film her. So that was like a, an improvisation. And then in the editing, we had to completely create the story because I had no clue what I was doing when we were shooting. Um, and I guess Wanderers, it was the same, but I had a better idea of what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about what people, um, about the escapism, the idea of escaping your life and about people dreaming of, uh, of outside of their lives, uh, dreaming of somewhere else and what drives them to dream of somewhere else than their own lives, you know? So I was really searching for that. Uh, the, the main challenge there was that I had to do everything, directing, filming, and sound. And uh, I actually got coached by my sound engineer who, who did the Svalbard and Einstein Telescope, who really explained me how to do the job. And I wanted to sound, the sound to be good. So I really like brought, brought this huge piece of, <laughs> of equipment that I was recording with. So. Yeah, there were a lot of technical sounds. And when we were going out on the EVAs, um, I had to wear the sound device and my suit 13 kilos. And then we were going up the hills and I had my camera and the tripod. And I was like, okay, why am I doing this? <laughs> what, what's the purpose? But I was really happy with the result in the end. Yeah, it, it, is, am it is amazing. Actually, you have, uh, you have some images that they they would look so good in a painting they're just they're just beautiful yeah yeah i, I love the three the three of the, your projects i love them and um well now okay. the next question this one is is prepared you've read about it uh i want yes. to know how was the experience of working at miyubita and how you ended working as part of the crew because as far as i understand uh i know uh noemi she is uh, quite known in, 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 in France and nowadays in the whole world. But in that moment, when Miyu Bita uh, started filming, I believe she wasn't the phenomenon that it's nowadays because Portrait was actually not, not screening uh, or- It was. Oh, it was oh, exactly well, the same moment, I think. Yeah, I, I don't know, in, 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 in America, I think it wasn't, but maybe yeah, in France, of course, it was. It was in France. I don't know. I, I don't know I the think, dates. I think they presented it in Cannes in May. Yeah. Oh yeah. You're, yeah. You're totally right. And you started filming what? In July 2019. Oh, then, then, then it started that was three years ago. Wow, that's amazing. So, so how was the experience of working in Miyubita, and how you ended working as part of the crew? Because I've only seen the teasers. Yes. <laughs> and everything that that all of you girls just just put on the on your uh, Insta stories, and yeah. as part I of the cinematography, clear. it looks beautiful. I don't know, but I'm in love with the colors. I don't know uh, what what is about, but yeah. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> I have it. I'm gonna give one to my parents. <laughs> wow, it's 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 super cool. I, I love that you were prepared with your stuff. <laughs> it was just there. Oh, I didn't prepare I didn't anything a, a week ago or something. <laughs> uh, so, so how you ended up there, and uh, and and how was the experience of of working? I, I mean, I asked I ask you this because I've, as far as I know, I've heard in some interviews that it was a um, it didn't have a lot of of funding, a lot of money to do the to do the movie, so it was really independent film really independent. <laughs> yeah yeah so i want to i want to know how was it just so your experience and your job yeah. Of course, there. yeah so it's funny that you ask me um how did i end up in the crew um because actually today there was this um article published in, in the 20 minutes journal it's like a parisian uh, everyday uh, small journal that everybody takes in the underground with them and Noemi was very furious about their article because they like put a lot of not like uh, real stuff in it. And they were saying, <laughs> there was this phrase that said, 
that all of the crew, well, basically two technicians, me and Armand, who did the sound, that we were recruited on the internet. And we were like, what? Like, if, if Naomi put an announce on Craigslist or something and everybody just responded and when they were, we were recruited on the internet. Uh, well, at least for me, it didn't go this way. So uh, Naomi directed this short film called um, Shakira. And uh, um, her cinematographer, uh, Raphael, who did a very great job on this short, uh, on this short fiction. I really loved what he did. We actually shared the same color grader, um, worked with the same guy who's really talented. And uh, Raphael was in my, in my school as well, but one year older than me. So uh, when this idea of Mi Yubita Mon came up for Noemi, she really wanted to go with a female crew. So she couldn't take Raphael with, with her, even though he did a really great job. So he gave her several names and my name was among them. And so Noemi wrote me a, a mail and we just met and we immediately connected together. Um, I mean, um, I don't know, she, she, she was very open and I was very open and we, we didn't really care about talking about some cheesy inspirations you know behind behind the, the cinema that we like because we even like we quoted call me by your name we quoted titanic we we'll, we were talking about mixed with my love um l'amant de jean jacques Anou, uh different a lot of different films and we were like okay this is the connection and it was one month before going to romania so yeah so this film there is there was no production behind it so basically we were engaging in as um uh, as being not non-paid for the project and as so collaborators literally right? yeah 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 um so uh so we we went in there so basically me our months and four actresses uh Naomi being one of them and we drove in this car and we put all the equipment like on the top of the car and, and in the back and we had actually some uh how, how do you call it, light reflectors that were attached to the ceiling of the car. And we had this two days travel from France to Austria to Romania. And it was like completely epic. And we arrived there and we had, and we lived at Jimmy's family. So Jimmy is the, is the actor who, who plays uh, Nino's character in the film. Uh, and we were staying at his house with his family. So basically we were like sleeping on the couch with no, uh, she bed sheets. We were like three by 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 couch and and eating at like I don't know no matter which hours and we were shooting day and night because we had uh, I think we had between fourteen or sixteen days to shoot the whole film. Um, yeah, so it was super quick and I had very light camera and I was doing the the flow. I was doing the the focus in myself and I had like really like two small lights that were used sometimes but most of the times i didn't have any time so uh, it was a very uh, like you know documentary style as well so uh, i could actually uh, a lot i used a lot my skill in documentary being there so basically we had the script you know where we knew like main directions where we go and then like at some point like just there would be like four actresses and actors just in front of me and i would have just like film what was going on you know their discussions and we really didn't have time to put the camera like to do I don't know 10 shots per, per scene we didn't have time for that so they were for example discussing in front of me and I was just like following their discussion and looking for some some uh, interesting moments and like really trusting my guts when I was there and uh, at the end of the one shot per scene we would discuss with Noemi whether we need to do some uh, some special shots for, for any special moments or whether it it's actually editable what what we filmed like if it's gonna be a film or is it like not gonna be watchable watchable at all so it was kind of it was I don't know it was a bet we, we didn't know whether it, it would be a real film or not so we were like really just doing our best at the moment and everybody kind of participated in directing the the atmosphere was very friendly it was really like a film created in between our group you know like we were all co-creating together and uh, the, um, the energy of the group was amazing. And I guess that's why the film ended up being a film and going out in, in movie theaters, because just like, I, I don't know, it tells something about the state of mind we were when we were filming there. Yeah, 
if you have any more precise questions about the filming. Uh, I, I, I've, as I said, I haven't seen it actually. Uh, we, we want to, to have Noemi here in Mexico, actually in the festival. Um, and it would be amazing to, to screen Mi Vita and everything. But as far as I've seen, uh, a lot of comments are about the cinematography, the colors oh. you used. Uh, I've read that it was, it was filmed in summer or, or, or the story is, is okay. It's in summer. I was reading that you had that magic of making everyone feel like you are in summer, even though you, you don't watch it maybe in summer, like the colors and the atmosphere. And now I want to watch it, not only because I, I admire uh, Noemi and, and Sanda and everyone, because I admire your work too. So I, I wonder how it would look actually, but we couldn't watch it yet. Um, I think it's going to be premiered next week, right? On the, yeah, the on Wednesday, it's, it's coming out in the in French movies. Only, yeah, only in French movies. We're, we're, we need to wait. <laughs> yeah, but... Can you imagine, like three years later, after filming is going to be premiered? Three years later, that happens a lot, right? Yeah, that it's a difficult part, you know. You, you, I believe that having your project in your mind and doing yeah. all your effort, and you you finally watch it. I mean, but you you finally have it, but you have it three years later. Yeah. How long did it did it took for you? Did it take sorry for you to to finish Einstein Telescope? Because you said it was a lot <laughs> ages. A lot of writing, yeah. So I started writing it, I think, in 2016. Yeah. Then it was done writing in 2019. So three years of okay. on and off writing because I, I, I was still working as a cinematographer. So I didn't have that much time to, to write it. And, uh, and then, uh, so we started filming and then we had this six month blackout because of the pandemic. And then I think maybe four months more of post-production so it, yeah, I mean, short movies are taking as much time as the feature films in the end. <laughs> it, it's a very long process. So it took a it took a while too. Yeah, but yeah. finally, it it is out there finally. And um, as far as I understand, I, you tell me if I'm wrong. Your work uh, with um, Armand's it's her name. No, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I pronounce it. You pronounce it really well. Oh, like oh that's, that's, I, I feel, I feel blush right now. <laughs> so uh, your work with her, I believe it took you to the CST in Cannes, uh, a new okay. category if, uh, as far as I understand, but I don't know if it's, if I'm, if I'm wrong or if I'm correct. Can, can you, you uh, Yeah, I, I, I don't know if it's a new category. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the year that you actually won, you yeah, won, it, right? You got the... Uh, no, it was Armand who won it. Oh, wow. Well. Well, anyway, it's the movie who wanted, yeah. Yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the same family at the end. So can you tell us about the CST in Cannes? What, what does it mean and, and how do you feel? Yeah, because you, you were interviewed at the, at the official yes. Cannes channel. Yes. I actually watched it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so basically CST stands for uh, Technical Superior Commission. So basically it's, a, it's a, an organization in France who um how would i put it who unites everybody who works in the film industry and who is like director of photography sound engineers and all of the technical departments and its, its mission is to create dialogue between the departments and to talk about the in innovation in different departments and like well it's, it's a very great organization to be part of and basically uh since i think 1952 they were they were, they have been given the, the prize which is called used to be called volcano prize and then it was called the best technician prize so basically every year they they pick a person from a from an official selection some for example set designer or sound designer sound engineer or cinematographer and they distribute a, a prize per year and then the last year when we were in Cannes with a miubita they created a new prize which was called uh, the prize for a young technician for and technician female technician so uh, this this prize it's it's a very nice initiative this prize was created in the purpose of promoting females working on the top uh, positions in cinema so basically they found out that usually if uh, uh, in, at least in french cinema if uh, ladies don't do not succeed uh, uh, before 35 years old and if they get kids 
after that, it gets really complicated for, for them to get back into industry. You know, if you drop out for two or three years, you like you don't come back if you are not if you were not successful enough prior to your pregnancy. So basically, the idea of this prize is to uh, promote the uh, the work of the young uh, female technicians under the age of 35 and who get uh, whose work was selected in official selection. And what is kind of scandalous is that there were only three of us uh, eligible. So in the whole official selection, I can't remember how many films were there, but between 15 and 20, um, the only leading positions in technical uh, places, there were me, Armand's, and also Maria Miguel, who was a director, cinematographer, and I think sound engineer. I'm not sure. I don't. I don't want to like hear. But she did a lot of work in her documentary called uh, "The Snow Panther" or "Panther de Neige." So we were on. There were only three of us, proving that. And and the three, uh, the three. So basically, two films, three person, two films, and the two films, uh, the production were kind of you know. Uh, low budget style and very, very like um, wild, uh, I would say a production. And so meaning that actually the well-established and rich productions don't risk hiring uh, young females on top positions, you know? So I hope with this prize uh, promoting this work, it's gonna get better and better. But so we, it was the first edition last year and uh, Armand's to our big pleasure won the prize. That's that's incredible that, that you were, but you were selected too. There, there, I was eligible. And, like, we, yeah, I, okay. And Mary, basically, we were three, the only three eligible for the for the prize. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing because it talks a lot about your your work. But on the other side, it's quite uh, sad because it 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 puts again on the table, the, the, this concept or this, this thing that there's a lot of missing females at the, at the yeah. female industry. No, we're, I know we're improving and there are more directors and there are more uh, uh, cinematographers and technicians. And uh, I know, but we're still missing. There, there's a, a big uh, branch. I don't know how to say it. There's a, there's a big difference between the male and the female in the industry and that thing that you're saying i think it's quite quite interesting and quite important because people we need to we need to have the courage to create or to do and to and to just portray our voices our and our ideas and our work it doesn't matter what people say like 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 you actually said a few minutes ago it doesn't matter what people say it doesn't matter if if we're not as good as we think at the beginning the the First step that we need to do as females, I don't know if you agree, is to do it, you know, yeah. to, to, to take the risk. And actually, that takes me to the next question, that is, what female stories you believe we are missing in cinema? Um, me personally, what I'm missing in cinema is uh, stories about contradictory women you know because like i feel like we have we're starting to have a lot of superhero female characters or super um simple characters as well female characters but what i really like and it doesn't matter about it doesn't matter of gender but i like complex characters who have their like uh, bad traits, who have their doubts, who behave badly sometimes, and who have this, like, you know, inner work in them. I don't want to, I, I'm not interested in seeing a movie about somebody who's perfect, you know, I can't relate to that. I, I'm just, I feel it's like very plain, you know, it's like there is no, no deepness in that. And I feel like we're missing female characters like that. Um, I mean, in TV shows, it starts to, 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 to develop, like, I mean, you take Homeland, you take Top of the Lake, or The Killing, uh, Handmaid's Tale. Like, uh, they have female I know, yes. <laughs> they have re really interesting female characters that are deep and are interesting on so many levels. But, like, 
I don't know whether you noticed, but most of them are journalists or detectives. Like if any other job never existed, but the, I really want to bring it to, to the cinema and really like exploring more outside of those two positions, you know, that would be something that would interest me. That is quite interesting. Non-perfect uh, yes. characters, Com right? Complex characters, yeah. Complex characters, complex stories too, because complex characters bring complex stories too. Yeah, but still being human, you know? Yeah. So now you, you, can, you can write the next complex character and, and the next complex uh, story for, for cinema. Yeah, it's amazing that you say that because, because I believe that we, as females, we want to, to, to see different stories out there, like the, the famous um, expression of female gaze. Yes. You know, how, how we portray things and how we, we talk about things and how we create things. And so, so the concept that you're saying, I think it's quite interesting. And last but not least, I have another question. I didn't wrote it to you because I, I want you to think about it. If you could tell me um, one of the best advice that you've ever received in your life, what would it, it be? Concerning professional life? Concerning, uh, it could be professional and it can be uh, personal. If you have one that applies to both, it's fantastic. You can think. Oh yeah, you can think. <laughs> can you put like some music for a thinking time? <laughs> yeah, of <laughs> course. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. We, we, yeah. we, we can. You, you can. You can think about it. And while you are think about uh, while you are thinking about it, I want the people that it's here in the in the Zoom meeting because we have people in in the YouTube. Uh, you know, our YouTube page, but I cannot see it. If you have any questions that you want to ask, please start writing in the in the chat. Do you have more time? I'm sorry, I'm oh, just... I do, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, that's fantastic then. So if you have questions uh, here in the, in the public, please just write here in the chat while Evgenia thinks about her answer. <laughs> um, actually, I mentioned that I'm a huge fan of psychoanalysis and psychology in general. Yeah. I just can't find any precise phrase, but definitely best advice in my life, best pieces of advice in my life. They came from my best friend who is actually online now. I can see her. It's Natalie Powers. Hello, Natalie. Hello, Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> she's actually um, my best friend and she's based in London. She's an amazing doctor. And like every time I have a doubt, I just call her. And she's also a, a feminist badass, you know. She used to study politics and she became a doctor today. And like, if I need a piece of advice, it all it always comes from her. The best pieces always come from her. And basically, it's all always about like um, mind your own life, I guess. It's about like just enjoying things you, you, you do in life. And um, I think it, it goes back to the question about the imposter syndrome, you know? Like at some point, like, Life is too short to spend it on, on doubting or on caring about people who don't really care about you, you know? And same for work. I mean, there are a lot of stories in the industry about like um, fem uh, women working in, in cinema being treated like, I don't know, um, facing discrimination and something. And I just like, for, as for me, I, I just like, I guess I don't care. Like if somebody tries to discriminate me, I'm just like, I'm moving on and I'm doing my, I'm continuing doing my job. And I guess for me, it's the best attitude. Just like keep calm <laughs> and, uh, and keep on with your life. <laughs> Something keep like that. Keep filming. <laughs> I mean, and there is this phrase, which means, and this shall pass, everything passes and just try to try to enjoy it every minute you can. Wow, two, two great advice, advices, actually. Uh, I'm sorry for going to some philosophical stuff. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's fine. It's, it's about that. Actually, film is philosophical. It's political. It's social. So you can talk about everything, everything you want. So yeah, the, the, the advice that you gave us, I think it's quite, quite uh, important and, and incredible. And we have a, like a signature question for... Yes. for uh, no, before that, I want to ask you something else about your work, because I, I, now that I said signature, I want to ask you something. 
do you have a kind of signature, artistic signature that you believe that you have in every one of your projects? I, I mean, uh, a certain kind of uh, colorimetry, certain frames, something that you say, I'm Evgenia, I'm, uh, I'm going to always use this in every project I do. Do you have that kind of signature or you haven't developed one yet? I have this thing when, when I do the handheld, I really like being close and being there, you know, if something is happening in front of me, I'm just, I'm always like, for example, I'm filming the face and with my eye, I'm trying to see what's going on <laughs> outside of the frame. And then if I see a gesture or something that can tell the story, otherwise than being talked with your, with your mouth, I'm just going to grab it. That, that's, that's a very intuitive approach, I guess. And I have trust in my guts in this. I'm just, that's what gives me the most pleasure, you know, like kind of a aesthetical uh, orgasm or something. Because when, when you're filming and you're something that happens in front of your screen, in front of the camera, it's like you have this synergy and you just want to be there. And this is, I guess, I'm not sure if it's translated in some particular image, but I guess it's like me being in the moment. And I guess this is what I would call my, my your signature. Your essence, your, your signature. Yeah. Okay. That, that's amazing. We have a question of your best friend. Oh. Uh, yeah. It says, uh, what is your biggest dream goal in, cin in cinema? Um, I'm not sure because it's not like, you know, when you say goal, it's something like the end destination. And I don't, I don't like thinking of destinations. I like thinking about path and about process. And I really want like uh, continue enjoying and feeling more and more those uh, aesthetical orgasm <laughs> while I'm, I'm working and being useful to the story. And always what I like about cinema, like it, my brain boils when I, when I film, you know, I'm constantly thinking how to tell the story, how to, how to put myself in the best position to tell the story. And I love this feeling. I love my brain being challenged and I just hope I can continue doing that. Um, not diving into some very, very well-paid commercials, you know, where you're just doing some aesthetics and not like deep brain thinking. And I hope I, I can continue doing that and, and I continue to, to receive inspiring uh, scripts uh, on, on which I can work. And as for directing, I really hope I can find my, my voice, uh, which would be um, also interesting for other people. Because like the three movies that you mentioned, basically they, all three of them, they were more recognized outside of France than inside France. Because I think my style is kind of, for example, Einstein Telescope, I think it sounds a bit too Hollywoodian for French authors uh, in, in, in French film festivals. So they kind of don't accept it really much. And I really hope I can find some um, language of mine that would talk to people in France as well. You know, I really hope to find something at the same moment, very pers it would still be personal, but um, finding an echo in people's hearts, I guess, or brains. That is amazing. And you will find it. I, I think it's quite common. I, I believe if you live in France and you produce and create and film in France, maybe a lot of your work is not going to be recognized in France. It's going to be recognized outside of France. It, it happens a lot in Mexico. Mexican, yeah. Mexican uh, films, there are a lot of films that are amazing but you don't watch those in cinemas here you watch some other yeah things and uh and the most important ones the best ones they actually have a lot of uh recognition in Cannes or in uh, berlin well, berlinel i don't know how it's pronounced in english and spanish or in a lot of festivals and and that's kind of sad but i think that's cool too because you can expand your ideas and, and your, and your uh, creative way of doing things to some other continents or, or places. So, so yeah, I, I, I believe you're going to find your, your voice and, and, and the French voice that you need to find. <laughs>
<laughs> so French people <laughs> just accepted it. They're missing a lot if they don't accept. Let me mm -hmm. let me tell you that, guys. So uh, we have another question from Mitch. Uh, would you like to work with film, celluloid, and with what purpose? As everything in cinematography, it depends on the story. I mean, there are stories that need to be told in film. Um, that's funny because I'm preparing a, a feature that I will be shooting in Brazil, uh, starting in, from September. And the directors, there, there are two of them, they're uh, used to shooting in film and it's gonna be their first project shot in digital because of the budget. And so our work is, I actually did some tests for them two days ago. And my job was to find the look that will appeal, would be appealing to them, even though they like film so much. So I really tried to, to experiment something that would be good for them. Um, I mean, I would love to sh shoot and film, but it really depends on the, on the project that come to me. So there's that. Um, now, I, I, <laughs> finally, <laughs> last but not least, um, we have we have our signature question. Um, let me think it uh, through a non-regional concept because we always talk about Mexico or about Latin America. But what do you think that as a gender we need to do to to have uh, more equality in the film industry worldwide as as a female gender, actually? Mm -hmm. I guess we just need to go there, you know? And, um, and I think like uh, I grew up in Russia and I, I was never, I was, when I was there, I wasn't feeling that I could ex um, have an access to the film industry there. I was like, and it's not because I was, I was a woman, but because I felt like it was like, there was a lot of nepotism and you have, to, you had to have connections to get in there. But France really opened my mind in that. and. That gave me so many possibilities in it. And I mean, I could have stayed in my shell, you know, and not going to, 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 to do the job I like. But in the end, like, just trust your instincts and, and just go there. That's what we need to do. But, um, and there are a lot of, you know, um, there are more and more film directors, female film, film directors that appear. and. I actually frequently get asked by female directors to film on their films because of the solidarity, like the sisterhood. And I think we need to keep that because it's, 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 I mean, you don't have to choose a person for a film depending on their gender, but sometimes, yes, you do. So that's how Noemi picked me for, for, for Miyubita, you know, she wanted to go female, female, full female crew. So I guess like, stay, mm, staying in the sisterhood and spread it, spreading awareness, I guess, talking uh, around ourselves about how we feel, how we work, what, what problems do we face being a female in, in the cinema industry. I guess that's the most important. Thank you very much. That, that was the correct answer. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah, that, that's this. amazing. Sorority at the end, right? Sisterhood, yeah. sorority. That, exactly. That's amazing. Well, uh, I don't know if you, the Yanira, have something else to ask or someone else wants to ask something in the chat, uh, in the chat box, please. As far uh, as, as, as Filminist can, can tell you is, thank you very much for your time, Evgenia. Uh, I hope to meet you in person. It would be amazing. Oh, actually. I would love to. Yeah, it, it would be amazing. I'm planning to go on Mars, so it, it, would, be, it would be great if you're, <laughs> if you're over there. Uh, <laughs> And uh, thank you very much for your knowledge, for your time, for your disposition, and for every single uh, idea and uh, thought and um, yeah, and advice you gave us because because it is really amazing to learn from people as talented as you are and believe uh, you you need to believe that your work is really really amazing and that there's a lot of people that would love to watch it but maybe they don't know it exists. So we hope filmist. Even though we are, as far as today, a small community uh, now, 
we hope that we can help people to to watch your job and to know more about you because you really have a big big talent and uh, it would be amazing to watch more projects where you are involved and or as a director or I don't know a screenwriter or a cine photographer but we hope we can watch a lot of a lot of your projects from now on and well this is your your house this is another family for you and you're welcome every time you want every time you have a project this place is for you muchas gracias nina it was actually a big pleasure to talk to you it was actually it went even better than what i was expecting because uh, we talked about things we're both passionate about and like um i mean i had a very great time and thank you so much to all of those people being present tonight it was a great great pleasure and i really hope that your festival is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and get huge one day so we'll do our best to promote it and i hope i can come one day of yeah. course you're invited if you want to come to this edition you are invited to <laughs> so maybe you can say when is it it's in november it's uh november 17 to 19 Mm -hmm. uh, this year, it's in a small city called Querétaro. Um, I don't know, uh, the, the best uh, explanation or the best example I can give is uh, I, I went in June to, to Paris and to Sergi Pontoise. And oh my God. it's, it's, it's kind of it's similar, you know? Uh, Querétaro, it's like Sergi. And yes. Mexico City is like uh, Paris. So, so our festival, it's in Querétaro. It's a really, really beautiful city. You are invited. It will be, it will be amazing. Uh, I can write to you and talk about that uh, later, of course, but you are more than welcome. And, and it would be, it would be amazing to have you and to have you in every, uh, in every monthly dialogue that we can, or, or in some other monthly dialogues that we have, it would be amazing to have you. As, as Thank you guest. so much. It sounds amazing. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I, well, there's someone that it says that, thank you, that it worked a lot, that she wants to watch every of your projects, <laughs> uh, that she's a fan of yours. There's another people writing. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dejanita. I don't know if you want to add something. No, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all. Yeah. Bon, bonsoir. I don't know if it's bonsoir or bonsoir. I don't know. I don't know if, which bonsoir. one. Bonsoir. I don't know yes. why, but bon soirée. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Evgenia. Thank you, Thank you everybody. I'm going to end up this uh, 